Section 4 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Chapter 3 Dead Men's Shoes, Part 2. When Max Gershon entered the salesroom of Potash and Perlmutter that afternoon, Abe treated the incident as though it were the arrival of an intimate friend after an absence of many years' duration. "'How you feelin' now, Max?' he said. And then he introduced his partner. "'Morris,' he called. "'This is my friend, Mr. Max Gershon. Get the cigars from the safe, Morris.' After he had relieved his visitor of his hat and coat, he drew forward a comfortable chair and literally thrust Max into it. "'Well, Max,' Abe said, after the cigars had gone around, "'I sure am glad to see you. Morris, don't he look like his uncle, old man Baum?' Morris regarded Max critically for a moment. "'Old man Baum was a pretty good-looking fella, Abe.' he said, but he wasn't so tall as Mr. Gershon. Otherwise, they are the same identical people. Never mind his looks, Max said, beaming. If I should have only his business ability, I would be satisfied. He made plenty money in his time, Morris commented. Yes, and lost it again, too, Max added. But what's the use talking? Money I ain't in need of exactly, you understand? You need goods, Max, Abe said. Is that it? "'Well, I do and I don't, Abe,' Max replied. "'The fact is, Abe, I got a good business down in Johnsville, "'but I couldn't extend it none on account the place ain't big enough. "'Former times that was all cattle country round there, "'and now it's all truck farms and cotton. "'And what sort of business could a dry goods merchant do with cotton hands, ain't I right?' "'Abe nodded. "'I tell you the honest truth, Abe,' Max continued. I would like to sell out and come north. I got an idea if I would find some hustling young fella up here which he got at a good department store, good but small, you understand, in a live town, Abe, I would go with him as partners together and we could extend the business and make a good thing of it. Abe looked at Morris, and then he slapped his thigh with his open hand. By Jiminy, he cried, I got the very thing for you, Max. Morris gazed at his partner with raised eyebrows, and then he, too, slapped his thigh. "'Alex Kronberg!' he exclaimed. "'That's the fella, Abe said. "'There's a man, Max, which he is honest like the day and smart as a cutting machine. "'I know him since he was a baby, you understand? "'And he's worked his way up till now he's got a fine business in Bridgetown. Only yesterday, he says to me, if he could get a live partner with a little capital, you understand, he would soon got the biggest store in Bridgetown. What for a town is Bridgetown? Max asked. Bridgetown is all right, Max, Abe said. I give you my word, Max, they got so many factories there which they burn soft coal on the brightest days you couldn't see the sun at all. It is an elegant place, Max. And what is more, Max, Morris added, only last Saturday night, Alex tells me the store was so crowded two saleswomen fainted. It sounds good, Max admitted. Who did you say owns the store? Alex Kronberg, Morris replied. Kronberg, Kronberg, Max repeated. The name sounds familiar. When did you say he would be here? He ought to be in here every minute, Abe said. Hardly had he spoken when the elevator door clanged and Alex himself entered. He glistened with perspiration, and his round, good-humored face bore a broad grin. Fooey! he cried. I'm all heated up. What's the trouble, Alex? Morris asked. I just ran into Aaron and Uncle Moshe coming out of a coffee house, and the way them two suckers cussed me out, Morris, you wouldn't believe it at all. I couldn't understand what they was talking about, Morris, but they mentioned your name and something about Moshe's house on Madison Street. Abe glared at Morris, and then turned to Alex with a forced smile. Don't you bother yourself about them fellas, Alex, he said. What do I care for him, Abe? Alex replied. I got my own troubles. Sure, 
Morris broke in. But what did they say about the house, Alex? So far what I could hear, Morris. Aaron says that you're trying to buy from Moshe the house. No such thing, Alex, believe me, Abe interrupted. But Aaron says he's already got a customer for the house, Alex went on. And who do you think it is? Abe wiped his forehead with his handkerchief and continued to glare at Morris. I don't know who it is, Abe said, and what's more, I don't care. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Alex. This is Mr. Max Gershon from Johnsville, Texas. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Gershon, Alex replied. Yes, Morris. Aaron said he sold the house already, and who do you think he sold it to? Morris made an inarticulate noise, which he intended as an expression of curiosity. A friend of yours by the name of Leon Samet, Alex Kronberg said. You see how it is, Aaron Kronberg said to his Uncle Moshe, as they passed down Fifth Avenue after their encounter with Alex. You see how he is. The fella is a desperate character, Uncle Moshe. You couldn't make him mad even. A low life, Uncle Moshe cried, shaking his head from side to side. His mother before him was just such another like him. I could spit blood hollering at that woman, and she wouldn't answer me back at all. Well, now you got it, Aaron retorted triumphantly, and so if you would start to sell your house to his friend Perlmutter, the least that happens to you is they would do you for the whole thing. Maybe you're right, Uncle Moshe admitted, and so I'm going to take you over to see a friend of mine by the name of Leon Samet. Aaron continued, and if you want to leave the thing to me, Uncle Moshe, I am certain sure I could get you a good price for the house. Certain sure nobody could be of getting a good price for a house in these times, Aaron, Uncle Moshe said. Real estate on the east side is way down, Aaron. The subway ruins everything. I don't care about subways nor nothing, Aaron cried. I would get you what you want for that house. What would you consider a good price for the house, Uncle? A very good price would be forty-two to fifty, Uncle Moshe replied. But me, I would be willing to accept forty thousand. Well, looky here, Aaron commenced. I'm going to do this for you, Uncle Moshe. I'm going to get Leon Samet to give you not forty thousand or forty-two to fifty neither. I'm going to get Leon Samet to give you forty-three thousand for the house, Uncle. But I only do it on one condition, Uncle. And what is that? Uncle Moshe said. I would do it for you only on one condition you come to live with me at Port Sullivan, Aaron concluded, and also you must give me to take care of it for you all the cash money you got for the house. Uncle Moshe frowned as he drew from his pocket a small packet wrapped in newspaper. Then he proceeded to unwrap until there was exposed the unburnt half of a large black cigar. It was all that remained of Morris Perlmutter's gift, and Uncle Moshe carefully knocked the ash off before he put it in his mouth. Why don't you answer me? Aaron asked. I got to think, ain't I? Uncle Moshe mumbled as he paused to light up. He puffed away in silence until they had nearly reached the entrance to Samet Brothers' place of business. Sean Gut, Aaron. Uncle Moshe said at length, I will do it with this here exception. I would sell the house for $43,000, subject to a first mortgage of $25,000, and a second mortgage of $9,250. That leaves $8,750 balance, ain't it? Aaron nodded. Then this here Samet is to pay $750 cash on signing the contract, and eight thousand dollars on closing the title, Uncle Moshe declared. And the exception is that you should take care of the eight thousand dollars, but the seven hundred and fifty dollars belongs to me, and I could do what I like with it. For ten minutes, Aaron argued with his uncle in front of Samet Brothers' building, but all to no purpose, for Uncle Moshe remained unmoved. Either he was to receive the $750 on the signing of the contract, or the entire deal was off, and at length he prevailed. All right, Aaron said. You should have the 750 but one thing you must got to do. When we got into Leon Samet's loft, I want you to let me and Leon speak a few words. Something alone together. 
Are you agreeable? Sure. Why not? Uncle Moshe agreed. You got to work the feller up to buying the house yet, ain't you? Aaron nodded gloomily as they entered the elevator, and when it stopped at Samet Brothers' floor, he strode out so rapidly that Uncle Moshe, who had never before visited Samet Brothers, hardly noticed his nephew's exit. Before he could follow Aaron, the elevator attendant slammed the door, and it was not reopened until Uncle Moshe had expressed his agitation in a burst of spirited profanity. "'Did you see that, Aaron?' he exclaimed after he caught up to his nephew. "'I came pretty close to getting killed just now in that there elevator.' "'Why don't you keep your eyes open?' Aaron asked callously. "'Now you sit down here and wait until I'm coming out.' He entered Leon Samet's private office, and as soon as Uncle Moshe found himself alone in the showroom, he clenched the butt of his cigar between his yellow teeth and explored his pockets for pencil and paper. Having found them, he was soon plunged in a maze of figures representing the profit in going short of 700 shares on a one-point margin, assuming that the market dropped eight points in ten days. "'Hello, Aaron,' Leon Samet cried when he caught sight of the younger Kronberg. Aaron nodded with half-closed eyes. "'Sit down, Aaron,' Leon continued. "'You look worried.' "'I bet you,' Aaron replied. "'Why do you think of that sucker?' "'What's Alex been doing now?' Leon asked. "'Alex? What do you mean, Alex?' Aaron said. "'Alex ain't worried about it all. I mean Uncle Moshe Kronberg. Forthwith, he unfolded to Leon the sum of his uncle's iniquities, sparing no detail of his own well-nigh ruined prospects, and ending with an account of Uncle Moshe's interrupted deal with Morris Perlmutter. Leon slammed the top of his desk with his open hand. Before I would let that shark Perlmutter get to the house, I would buy it myself. Sure, I know, Aaron replied. I thought you would, Leon, but that ain't necessary. All I want you to do is this, Leon. I told the old man I can get you to buy the house for forty-three thousand dollars. Forty-three thousand! Leon exclaimed. Why, that house ain't worth forty-three thousand. What do I care what it's worth? Aaron replied. The game is this, Leon. You will buy the house for me, Aaron, with my money. You got to pay seven hundred and fifty cash on signing the contract, and the balance of eight thousand dollars above the mortgages you got to pay when the title is closed. I fixed it with the old man that he is to give me the $8,000 to take care of for him, see? So when the title is closed, I will give you $8,000 to give Moshe, and Moshe will turn it back to me. And Leon, if he ever sees that $8,000 again, it won't be this side of the grave. Leon nodded. Meantime, you got the house, he said. Exactly, Aaron replied. I get the house. All it cost me is $750 cash, and I also get unloaded on me for the rest of his life, the old man. And while I don't wish him any harm, you understand, God so hooten, anything should happen to him, Leon. It couldn't come too soon for me. I bet you, Leon said fervently. And now let's get him in here and we'll all go down to Henry D. Feldman's office and fix the matter up. Two hours later, Leon and Uncle Moshe had signed a contract for the sale of the Madison Street house, title to be closed and deed to be delivered within 30 days. The purchase price was stated to be $43,000, payable as follows. $34,250 by the vendee taking the house, subject to mortgages aggregating that amount, $750 cash on signing the contract, and a balance of $8,000 in cash or certified check at the closing of the title. Prior to leaving his office, Leon had cashed Aaron Kronberg's check for $750, and the money, in bills of large denomination, was turned over to Moshe Kronberg, who tucked them carefully away in his breast pocket. "'Well, Aaron,' he said after the operation was completed, "'I guess I'll be going back to Madison Street.' "'Wait, I'll go along with you,' Aaron cried. "'Don't you trouble yourself.' Uncle Moshe declared with a confidential wink at Leon Samet and Henry D. Feldman. I could take care of myself, all right. What are you going to do with all that money, Mr. Kronberg? Leon asked as Uncle Moshe turned to leave. The old man paused with his hand on the door, 
and once more he favored his questioner with a significant wink. Leave that to me, he said. The thirty days succeeding Morris Perlmutter's visit to Madison Street were busy ones for all the Kronbergs. Alex had accompanied Max Gershon to Bridgetown, where conditions more than fulfilled Abe's glowing account, and the formation of the Kronberg Gershon Dry Goods Company proceeded without delay. As for Aaron Kronberg, he found that the borrowing of eight thousand dollars, even for so short a period as would be necessary to consummate the Madison Street deal, was no easy task. At length, he raised the sum by paying a large bonus to his bankers in Port Sullivan, and it was deposited to the credit of Samet Brothers four days before the closing of the title. Meantime, Uncle Moshe had not neglected the opportunity afforded him during his last few days of liberty. With his $750 he had sought the brokerage offices of Klingberg & Company the morning after signing his contract with Leon Samet. There, he selected American chocolate and cocoa as the medium of his speculation and promptly went short of 700 on a one-point margin. The same afternoon he was within a sixteenth of being wiped out when the market turned, and nearly one month later he took his profit of $2,100, which, with the original investment minus the brokerage, amounted to $2,800. Never no more, he said to the brokerage firm's cashier as he drew his profit. I am through once it and for all. No one could get me to touch another share of stock so long as I live. With this solemn declaration, he passed out of Klingberg & Company's office, just as a short, stout man burst into the hall from a door marked customers. Wow! the short, stout man exclaimed. Varum wow? Uncle Moshe asked. Amalgamated refineries goes up four points on six sales in half an hour, the short stout man replied, and I win two thousand. The short stout man started down the hall and executed a fantastic dancing step in front of the elevators, while Uncle Moshe entered the door marked customers. Mr. Klingberg, he said handing Klingberg and Company's $2,800 check to that firm's senior partner. Buy me 1,000 shares amalgamated refineries at the market. An hour later, he walked leisurely along Madison Street, and as he approached his own doorway, Aaron Kronberg swooped down upon him. Uncle Moshe, he almost screamed. Where was you? Where was I? Uncle Moshe replied. Why, I was uh, where I was. That's where I was. What difference does it make to you where I was? What difference does it make to me? Aaron cried. Ain't I putting up the, uh, don't you know you was due at Henry D. Feldman's office to close your title at one o'clock, and here it is half past one already. For a minute, Uncle Moshe's face fell. In the excitement of following the profitable course of his speculation, he had completely forgotten his real estate transaction, but he quickly recovered his composure. Oh, well, he said, let him wait. The house won't run away, Aaron. Let's go get a cup of coffee somewheres. Coffee nothing, Aaron growled. You're coming right along with me. I got a carriage waiting for you. He hustled the old man into a decrepit conveyance that was drawn up to the curve, and they started immediately for Henry D. Feldman's office. Honest, Aaron, Uncle Moshe sighed. I feel like I was riding to my own funeral. Don't worry, Uncle Moshe, Aaron said. With the tourists which I got it lately, you would quicker ride to mine. Well, Aaron, Uncle Moshe rejoined, as old man Baum used to say, we all got to die sooner or later, Aaron. And all we could take with us is our good name. You wouldn't got to pay no excess baggage rates on that, Aaron said, as the carriage came to a stop in front of Feldman's office building. Two minutes later, they entered the offices of Henry D. Feldman and were ushered immediately into the presence of that distinguished advocate himself. As they passed through the doorway, Feldman rose from his seat. He was not alone for at one side of a long library table sat Leon Samet, 
while opposite to him a tall, sandy-haired person methodically arranged various bundles of paper which he drew out of capacious pasteboard envelopes. "'Ah, gentlemen, you're here at last,' Feldman cried. "'Mr. Jones, this is Mr. Kronberg and his nephew, Mr. Aaron Kronberg. Mr. Jones is a representative of the Land Insurance and Title Guarantee Company, who, at my request, has examined the title to your house, Mr. Kronberg.' "'All right.' Uncle Moshe said. I ain't scared of him. I own the house since 1890 already. It's pretty near 20 years, and they ain't paid no Confederate money for it neither. Mr. Jones cleared his throat noisily, and as he did so, a round white object leaped from beneath his collar and bumped against his chin. It was his Adam's apple. Did you say you owned the house 20 years? he inquired in tones of such profundity that Feldman was obliged to ask him to repeat his question. At the second repetition, Uncle Moshe said that it might be a month less than twenty years. The record shows that you bought the house a little more than nineteen years ago, Mr. Jones continued. His manner suggested a hanging judge in the act of assuming the black cap, and therefore you could claim no adverse possession even assuming there were no disabilities. "'What do you mean, claim?' Uncle Moshe asked with asperity. "'I don't claim nothing. I already got seven hundred and fifty dollars, and there is coming to me eight thousand dollars more.' "'I think, Mr. Jones,' Feldman interrupted, "'I ought to explain to Mr. Kronberg the locus in quo.' Aaron Kronberg turned pale and wiped a few drops of perspiration from his forehead. "'What is there to explain, Mr. Feldman?' he broke in. Go ahead and close the title to the property. I couldn't sit here all day. There's a great deal to be explained, Feldman continued. He is unable to convey good title to the property non constat he received indeed of it in 1890. I never heard tell of the feller at all, Uncle Moshe exclaimed. I am the only one which received a deed of the property. Feldman gazed at Uncle Moshe for one dazed moment, and then proceeded. The last owner in Mr. Kronberg's claim of title, I mean his immediate vendor, was the only surviving collateral of an interstate, he said. That's where you make a big mistake, Uncle Moshe interrupted. The fellow which I bought the house from was a salesman for a shirt concern. Feldman glared at Uncle Moshe and was about to crush him with a flood of law Latin when the door opened. "'You got to excuse me for butting in, Mr. Feldman,' said a harsh voice, which presently was seen to issue from the person of Morris Perlmutter. "'But me and my partner has got to get back to the store, and Max and his partner is also busy today.' "'I'll be with you in just one moment, Mr. Perlmutter,' Feldman replied. "'You says that an hour ago,' Morris grumbled as he closed the door behind him. "'Now, Mr. Kronberg,' Feldman continued. I'd like to elucidate this situation for you as succinctly as possible. Do that afterward, if you got to do it, Uncle Moshe broke in. But just now tell me what the trouble is. What's the use talking to a mutt that don't understand the English language at all? Feldman cried. Listen here to me. You bought your house from a fellow called Nathan Baum. Sure I did, Uncle Moshe said. You remember him, Samet. He went to work and got killed in a railroad accident ten years ago already. Don't interrupt, Feldman cried. Nathan Baum was the brother of Max Baum, a former owner of the house. Max Baum died while he owned the house, and he left no will. And Nathan Baum claimed the house as the only heir of Max Baum. That's right, Moshe agreed. Nathan Baum was the only relative in the world which Max Baum got it. He had a sister she died before Max. Was Max Baum's sister ever married? Mr. Jones asked in funeral accents. Sure, she was married, Moshe answered. She was married to Sam Gershon. He works for years by Richter as a cutter. Sam is dead, too. Did they have any children? Mr. Jones inquired. One boy they had, Uncle Moshe said. Shall I ever forget it? What a beautiful boy that was, Mr. Feldman. A regular picture. Mrs. Gershon thinks a whole lot of that boy, too, I bet you. 
never mind the trimmings kronberg feldman broke in is the boy alive that's what we're anxious to know mr jones interrupted my company had ascertained that there was one son but we couldn't find out if he were dead or alive if the boy was alive mrs gershon would be alive too moshe said mrs gershon died on account of that boy what a lovely boy that was i can see him now the way he looked he had eyes black like coal and a here uncle moshe stopped short his jaw dropped and his fishy gray eyes seemed to start from his head as he gazed at the door it stood ajar some six inches and exposed the features of a person impatient to the point of frenzy excuse me mr feldman said the intruder i may be a rube from texas you understand but i got my feelings too and unless you come in here right away and close the matter up me and my partner will go and get our agreement fixed up somewhere else i'll be with you in just one moment mr gershon feldman replied gershon uncle moshe muttered gershon he rose to his feet and tottered across the room toward the doorway but at the threshold his strength failed him and he fell headlong to the floor in the scene of confusion that followed only henry d feldman remained calm he touched the electric button on his desk go down to the algonquin building and fetch a doctor he said to the office boy who responded and on your way out see if we have any blank petitions for administration in the surrogates court if we haven't buy a couple on your way back the old man may not pull through when uncle moshe's eyes opened in consciousness of his surroundings they rested on max gershon who bent over the old man as anxiously as did either of his nephews max gershon ain't it uncle moshe asked feebly gershon nodded you shouldn't try to talk he said i'm all right uncle moshe replied i need only a cup of coffee if Aaron would let me get it before I came here, this would never have happened. Aaron recognized the justice of his uncle's criticism by personally seeking a nearby restaurant, and after an interval of ten minutes, during which Abe and Morris took turns with Max and Alex in fanning the patient, he returned with a pot of steaming coffee. Uncle Moshe drank three cups in rapid succession and heaved a great sigh. You ain't got maybe a cigar about you, Max, he said smoke this uncle moshe alex kronberg cried pulling a large satiny invincible from his waistcoat pocket and thrusting it at his uncle for one hesitating minute the old man looked from alex to the cigar but at last its glossy perfection overcame his scruples much obliged alex he said that's eh, all right alex mumbled as he struck a match how do you feel now uncle first rate uncle moshe replied as he blew out great clouds of smoke although i ought to feel a whole lot worse alex when i see maxi gershon here twenty-five years ago i seen him last and he looks the same fat-faced fellow with the black eyes only to think he now comes back and takes away half my house from me i ain't come back to do no such thing max cried i could assure you mr kronberg although me and alex kronberg is going as partners together i never knew until i seen you here that you is any relation of his as for your house mr kronberg i don't know nothing about it at all don't you uncle moshe exclaimed well i'll tell you it's like this stegen aaron hissed don't open your mouth uncle moshe what do you mean don't open my mouth uncle moshe retorted do you think i'm a crook if I got a house which it don't belong to me at all, then I don't want it. He turned his back on Aaron, and straight away he narrated the full circumstances surrounding his purchase of the Madison Street house. Certainly, I ain't no lawyer nor nothing, he continued. But when old Max Baum died, you was due to get just as much as your Uncle Nathan out of his estate. And if Nathan Baum swindled me out of my money by claiming he owns the whole thing, that couldn't give me no right to your share, ain't it? Max nodded. Then what ain't mine I don't want at all. Uncle Moshe continued. And so, Maxie, you and me gives Leon Samet here a deed of the house, 
and Leon pays us the balance of eight thousand dollars. Out of that, you get four thousand three hundred and seventy-five dollars, because me, I already got seven hundred and fifty dollars. Are you agreeable to fix it that way, Samet? Leon looked at Aaron Kronberg, who was gulping convulsively in an effort to express adequately all he felt. At length, he commenced to address his uncle in husky tones. "'You cutthroat!' he croaked. "'You robber, you! You shed my blood! Give me back my seven hundred and fifty dollars!' "'Your seven hundred and fifty, Uncle Moshe exclaimed. "'That's what I said,' Aaron went on. His voice rose to a hoarse scream as he proceeded. "'Do you think anyone else would give forty-three thousand dollars for that doghouse but me? Semit ain't got nothing to do with it. He's only a dummy.' "'So!' Leon Samet said bitterly. "'I'm only a dummy, am I?' "'Wait. One minute,' Uncle Moshe cried. "'Do you mean you told me, Mr. Samet, that you was buying this here house for Aaron?' "'Well, that's about the size of it,' Leon admitted. "'Then what are you kicking about?' Uncle Moshe said. "'You are a dummy.' Throughout the moving scenes of that entire afternoon, Leon had acted the part of a disinterested onlooker to the point of lethargy, but now he fairly glared at Uncle Moshe. "'I don't get to stay here to be called names,' he said. "'My trouble's what you got to stay here for.' Uncle Moshe retorted, "'Yes, boys, what do you think for a highwayman like that Aaron Kronberg? Aaron blushed a fiery red. "'Come on, Leon,' he said. "'Let's get out of this.' "'Hold on,' Max Gershon shouted. "'Don't you do nothing of the kind, Samet. "'Me and Mr. Moshe Kronberg, we own this here house together, "'and he made a contract with you to sell you this here house which I stand by. "'Do you want to take it or to not? "'Because if not—' You would keep your seven hundred and fifty dollars. Leon Samet emitted a huge guffaw. That worries me a whole lot, he replied. As Aaron just told you, the seven hundred and fifty belongs to him. Very true, Feldman interrupted. But it was you who engaged me to examine that title, Mr. Samet, and my fees and disbursements in this matter amount to five hundred dollars. Leon Samet sat down again. Come on, Leon, Aaron cried. What are you waiting for? Do you mean to told me, Mr. Feldman, I owe you five hundred dollars? Leon asked. Five hundred and eight dollars and forty-two cents, to be exact, said Feldman, crunching a slip of paper. Then all I gotta say is, Leon declared, I got here a certified check for eight thousand dollars which Aaron Cromer gives me, and I would sure hold it until he secures me against your bill. Say, looky here, boys, Alex Cronberg said at length, I've been listening to this here Megillah, and I ain't said a word nor nothing, but I'll tell you what I'll do. It's a cinch that Uncle Moshe won't go to live with Aaron now, so I'll take him to live with me. I am agreeable, said Uncle Moshe. Furthermore, Alex continued, Uncle Moshe and Max will keep the house. I will also pay Mr. Feldman his five hundred dollars, and take it out of the seven hundred and fifty which Aaron paid Uncle Moshe. The balance of two hundred and fifty Aaron shall have back again. I am content. Uncle Moshe replied, I don't want none of Aaron's money, and you could take it from me, Alex. Aaron would never see none of my money. And now, gentlemen, let us fix up this co-partnership agreement, Max Gershon said, as Aaron Kronberg slunk out of the office, followed by Leon Samet. Mr. Potash and Mr. Perlmutter have wasted pretty near the whole afternoon here. That's all right, Abe said. I don't consider we wasted any time. Many a night I threw away four dollars taking a customer on the theater yet, when the show wasn't near so good as what we seen it this afternoon, and the customer ain't bought no goods off me anyhow. Don't you worry yourself about that, Abe, Max cried. You got a couple of customers at this show, which they would buy goods from you so long as we are in business. Don't you forget it. Ain't I right, Alex? Alex nodded. Come on, Uncle Moshe, he said. Come inside with us and see this through. I'll wait out here, Uncle Moshe replied. I got enough excitement for one afternoon. He waited until Mr. Jones of the title company had packed up his papers, and then, after Henry D. Feldman had followed the others into the adjoining room, he had closed the door behind him, 
Uncle Moshe touched the button on Feldman's desk. "'Go out and buy for me an evening paper,' he said to the boy who responded. "'Say,' the boy replied, "'there was a doctor waiting to see you for more than half an hour.' "'Tell him to wait a little longer yet,' Moshe rejoined. "'I may got to have him after I'm seeing the paper.' "'He ain't here now,' the boy said. "'He went away and says you should send him a check for five dollars.' "'I hope he didn't need the money for nothing particular,' Uncle Moshe commented. "'On account he stands a good show to be disappointed. "'Hurry up with the paper.' Ten minutes after the boy returned, he handed an evening paper to Uncle Moshe, who hastily planted a pair of pince-nez on his broad, flat nose and folded back the financial page. "'Now let's give a look.' he murmured to himself as he glanced hastily at the column marked the stock market at the head of the list appeared the following item sales forty five thousand one hundred amalgamated refineries highest forty six and five eighth lowest thirty eight and a half closing thirty eight and a half net change minus four and an eighth wiped again he muttered as he dropped the paper to the floor. Half an hour later, when Alex and Max Gershon came out of the adjoining room with the co-partnership agreement duly executed, they found Uncle Moshe calmly smoking the last of his cigar while he pondered over the News for Investors column. The tabulated list of quotations was not unnoticed by Max as he felt for another cigar to present to the old man. "'Do you ever speculate in Wall Street, Mr. Kronberg?' he asked. "'Once it upon a time I used to,' Uncle Moshe replied. "'But never no more, Maxie. "'It's a game which you couldn't beat. "'Take it from me, Maxie. "'Not if you was a hundred times so smart as old man Baum.'" "'Well, Abe,' Morris Perlmutter remarked as they sat in their showroom ten days after the events above noted, I did mix up in Alex Kronberg's family matters, and with all your croaking, what is the result? Alex has a good partner, Uncle Moshe has a good home, and ourselves we got a good order for three thousand dollars, which otherwise we wouldn't have got at all. What are you talking nonsense, Morris? Abe said. Things wouldn't have turned out the way they did if it wouldn't be. I met Max Gershon and Hammersmiths. That's what started it, Morris. Nothing of the kind, Abe. Morris retorted. What started it, Abe, was me when I went down to Madison Street and gave Uncle Moshe that cigar, Abe. I tell you, Abe, it's an old saying and a true one. Throw away a loaf of bread in the water, you understand? And sooner or later, Abe, it would come home like chickens to roost. End of chapter 3「ヴァイオレッド」。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。。
Max Koblet, King of Raincoats, Koblenet, The Rainshed Fabric, West 20th Street, New York. Sure, I know, Morris, Abe commented. He was always a big fake of that fella. Twenty years since already, I used to eat by Gifkin's on Canal Street, and one day, Max Koblen comes in and says to me, Abe, he says, I want you should drink a bottle of champagne and wine on me. In them days, Max works for old man Zutowski, selling boys reefers. Raincoats is like automobiles. No one had discovered him yet. What's the matter, Max, I says. Old man Zutowski giving you a raise, I says. Raise nothing, Max says. I got a boy up to my house. So I says, just because he got a boy, Max, I should get a headache and neglect my business, I says. Take the dollar and a quarter, Max, I says, and put it in the savings bank, and every time you give the boy a penny, make him put it away with the other money, I says. And the first thing you know, Max, I says, when the boy gets to be 20 years old, he's got anyhow a couple of hundred dollars in the savings bank. And what did Max say? Morris asked. He laughs at me, Morris, Abe replied. He says to me when that boy gets to be 20 years old, he wouldn't need to gotta have a couple of hundred dollars in the savings bank. I give him all the money he wants it. Well, Max was right, ain't it? Morris rejoined. He can give the boy all the money he wants. Money ain't everything what that boy wants, Morris, Abe said. A good potch on the side of the head once in a while is what that boy wants. So fresh that young fella is Morris, he wouldn't believe it at all. Actually, he runs an automobile, what Max bought it for him for $1,500, a birthday present. Besides, the other big car which Copeland got it. Max also runs automobiles at Sydney's age. Peace goods on a push cart from old man Zutowski's to the sponges was all that automobiling Max done it. Today, they are putting on styles yet, suckers. Well, say, Abe, Morris protested, what is it a skin off your nose? Supposing Max does buy automobiles for the boy. This is a free country, Abe. Sure, I know, Morris, Abe declared, as he revealed the nub of the whole matter. And supposing my Rosie don't play poker, which, God say dang, she couldn't tell a king from an ace. What is it that Mrs. Copeland's business? She ain't supposed to know that, Morris, and yet she didn't invite my Rosie to her poker party. Rosie wouldn't have gone anyhow, Morris, but that ain't the point. Ain't my Rosie just as good as Mrs. Klinger or to Mrs. Ellenbogen? Particularly Mrs. Ellenbogen, which three years ago even, Kleiman and Ellenbogen was still rated ten to 15,000, third credit. Only in the last two years they're coming up so, and the way that Mrs. Ellenbogen acts, you would think her husband got a bank in Frankfurt on Main when Rothschild was a new beginner yet. Such fake as a zen is too good for my Rosie, Morris. An idea. What do you worry yourself about women's fighting, Abe? Morris asked. Me worry myself, Morris, Abe cried. I much care for them people, Morris. I'm married to my Rosie now, going on twenty-six years. We'll be next May. And if I didn't know that she's got it on every one of them cows and looks, in refinement, and in every which way, Morris, then I could worry, Morris. As it is, Morris, for my part, they could play poker till they're black in the face. What's it my business? I got enough to attend to here in the store, Morris, without I should bother myself. I bet you, Morris agreed fervently. That reminds me, Abe, Shapolnik is leaving us on Saturday. Well, Morris, I couldn't exactly break my heart about that, you understand? Abe replied. Skirt cutters, he could always get plenty of them. What's the matter? He ain't satisfied. Nothing's the matter, Morris said. He's simply going into the pants business. His brother-in-law has got a small place downtown, and he's going as partners together with him. They ought to make a success of it, too, Abe, if Nerve would got anything to do with it. That fella actually wants me, I should give him an introduction to Fader of the Kosciuszko Bank. Sure, why not? Abe commented. Why not? Morris repeated. What would Fader think of us if we bring in a yokel like Shapolnik into his office? The fella ain't been two years in the country yet. Don't knock a fella like Shapolnik just because he ain't putting on no front, nor throwing no bluffs, Morris, Abe retorted. It's the faker with those four-carat diamond pin which is doing his credit as Morris. Both the yokel with the soup on his coat pays a hundred cents on the dollar every time. Half an hour later, Abe conducted his retiring skirt cutter to the Fifth Avenue branch of the Kajushko Bank and as they approached the corner of 19th Street on their return, they encountered Max Koblen, the raincoat king. He was about to enter the tonneau of an automobile, while Sidney Koblen, 
the heir apparent, sat at the tiller, arrayed in a silk duster and goggles. Max grinned maliciously as he noted Abe's shabby, bearded companion. "'Always entertaining the out-of-town trade, Abe,' he said. Abe relaxed his features in what he intended for a smile, but afterward he turned to Shapolnik with a scowl. "'Only one thing I gotta tell you, Shapolnik," he declared. "'Nowadays, if a fellow wants to make a success, he must gotta wear good clothes and look like a mensch, you understand? Never harms in business, Shapolnik, that a fellow should throw sometimes once in a while a little bluff.' Between the ages of sixteen and twenty, Sidney Colburn had so often tested the maxim, boys will be boys, that Max Koblen's patience at length became exhausted. Do you mean to told me you ain't got one cent left from the forty I gave you on Saturday? Max asked on the Monday morning following Shapolnik's resignation. Oh, what's biting you? Sidney cried. You sat behind me last night. If it wouldn't been for you, it wouldn't have played that last four hundred hand at all. Cost forty-eight dollars. The advice of yours. This was a facer to be sure, and Max paused before formulating a rejoinder. In the first place, Sidney, he began, you didn't got no right to lead no trump. I told you before lots of times, if you got the extra ten, get rid of your meld first. And in the second place, Sidney, I wouldn't stand for your extravagance no longer. It's time you turned around and attended to business. Ah, oh, you never give me no show, Sidney protested. You keep me monkeying around while other young fellows is out on the road. Look at Morty Savin and all them boys. Sure, I know, Max rejoined. They got heads on him. You couldn't add up eight figures together. And at your age for a fellow to write a hen like that, Sidney, what are you kicking about? Sidney exclaimed. When you was my age, you couldn't sign your name even. Well, that ain't here nor there, Sidney, Max replied, as he pulled out a bill from the roll which he produced from his trousers pocket. Here's ten dollars, and that's got to last you till Saturday night, you understand? Sidney grunted as he tucked the bill into his waistcoat. He had heard the same ultimatum once a week for the past two years, and he whistled cheerfully as he dispatched one of the stock boys for a package of cigarettes. An hour later he lunched at Hammersmith's, while Abe Potash sat at an adjacent table. As he consumed a modest portion of Rosbraten, Abe noted with a disapproving eye the cherry stone clams, green turtle soup, and filet Chateaubriand, which formed the menu of the heir apparent and when the latter topped off his meal with a half-pint of dry champagne and a café parfait, Abe seized his hat and fairly ran from the restaurant. If nobody would tell that fellow Koblen what a low-life bum he got for a son, Morris, he said as he entered the firm's private office ten minutes later, I will. Actually, with my own eyes, I seen it. That fella eats for five dollars a lunch. He ain't with a customer, no nothing. What is it your business what Sidney Koblen is eating, Abe? Morris rejoined. If you wouldn't notice every mouthful that fellow puts in his face at all, you would be back here a whole lot sooner. There's a fellow waiting for you in the showroom half an hour since. Who is he? Abe asked. I think it's that Mr. Hoosis from Seattle, what he was here last fall, and nearly bought from us them polo coats. I couldn't tell his face exactly, but you remember what a swell dresser that fellow was. Abe peered through the screen that divided the rooms. I think you're right, Morris, he said. I couldn't remember his name, Morris added, and that's why I didn't talk much to him. All I says was you'd be in soon. I gave him a cigar from the safe. Abe nodded and walked hurriedly out of the office. As he approached his caller, he extended his right hand. How do you do? he exclaimed, as he shook his visitor warmly by the hand. You're looking fine. The visitor smiled in return. I thought you were going to tell me that, he replied. Yes, indeed, you're looking a whole lot better than the last time I seen you, Abe said. When did you get in? I am here now, going on half an hour already. Well, why didn't you talk to my partner, Abe said. He could fix you up just as well as me. I did talk to him, the newcomer replied. 
but he is too stuck up to talk to me at all. Stuck up, Abe exclaimed, with a note of real anguish in his tones. Stuck up? Why, you don't know my partner at all, Mr. Uh, excuse me, do you get a card? The stranger drew a card from his waistcoat pocket, and with a proud gesture, handed it to Abe. It read as follows. Z. Katzberg. I. Shop. 530 West Washington Place, New York. Katzberg and Shop. Fine pants. I am taking your advice, Mr. Potash, he said. I am taking your advice all around. I cut him off. You cut what off? Abe asked. The whiskers, Mr. Potash. Also, I am making short the name. And Rusland, Shaponik is all right, Mr. Potash. But if a fellow wants to make a success in business, he should be a, a little up to date, ain't it? The cordial smile faded from Abe's face as he recognized his visitor. There's such a thing as being too much up to date, Shaponik, he said. You ain't got no right to fool my partner like that. Me, you couldn't fool for a minute. Right away, I says to myself, here's a fellow which he wants to ask us something. We should do him a favor. So spit it out, Shapolnik. What is it you want from us? Well, it's like this, Mr. Potash. Shapolnik began. Me and my partner, we are wanting to take on somebody for a drama. You understand? We must got it someone which he's already got a trade. Abba, he couldn't ask for too much money at the start on account we're going slow. If you know some young fellow which he wants the job, me and my partner would be much obliged, Mr. Potash. What do you think we're running here anyway, Shaponik? Abe retorted. An employment agency. I'm just taking chances. Might you would know somebody, maybe? Shaponik murmured as he rose to his feet. He seemed much relieved at Abe's refusal. And I hope you don't think I'm doing something out of the way. You know, Mr. Potash, me and my partner, we think a whole lot of your judgment. And if you would give us an advice... You're willing we should follow it. Well, I ain't mad at you, Shaponik, Abe said more mildly. But all the same, if you want to get a drama, you got a right to advertise for one. We would do so, Shaponik replied. And if you would be in a Nachbarschaft once in a while, Mr. Potash, me and my partner would consider it an honor if you were dropping in to see us. We only got a small place, Mr. Potash. He paused and fingered the texture of his waistcoat. But everything will be up to date, Mr. Potash, he concluded, just like you advised us to. Abe watched his late skirt cutter disappear into the elevator, and then he returned to the office where Morris impatiently awaited him. New Abe, Morris cried as he entered. Yes, Morris, Abe said with cutting emphasis. Good cigars don't care who smokes them. I suppose if Nathan, the shipping clerk, would come in here with a collar and a tie on and a clean shave, he would want to blow a bottle of champagne wine yet, huh? Just because a fellow shaves off his beard and buys himself a new suit of clothes, you couldn't recognize him at all? That was Shapolnik, which just went out of here. Shapolnik! Morris exclaimed. That dude was Shapolnik? Well, what do you think for a crook like that? Crooked Shapolnik ain't exactly, Abe interrupted. But it should be a lesson to you, Morris, that you wouldn't be so free with our cigars. All the fellow wants from us is we should recommend him a drummer. The nerve the fellow got it, Morris cried. He comes around here throwing bluffs. He needs a drummer yet. A new beginner like him going to hire no drummer, Abe. I bet he takes his pants under his arms and sees him 14th Street buyers on his way downtown in the morning. He ain't got no more use for a drummer than I got it for an airship. My tour insists he has, or he hasn't. Abe exclaimed. I anyhow told him he should advertise for one. As we are not running an employment agency here, Morris. And so, Morris, let's get busy on that order for Greaseman. I want to get away from here short, five o'clock today. What is the good I'm staying down at Riesenberger's if I never get a show to take it once in a while? A sea bath, maybe. Nevertheless, it was ten minutes past five before Abe boarded a cross-town car and although he made a wild sprint from the ferry landing on the Long Island side, he arrived at the train shed just in time to see the rear platform of the 545 for Arvine disappearing in a cloud of black smoke. 
he returned to the waiting room and as he was sadly inspecting the outer pages of the comic periodicals displayed in the newsstand a heavy hand clapped him on the shoulder hello abe cried a hearty voice and abe turned to view the perspiring features of max coblin the raincoat king abe returned the salutation without much enthusiasm why ain't you going down the automobile max he asked millionaires ain't got no excuse for missing trains like ordinary people max laughed in an embarrassed fashion millionaires has got their troubles too abe he said even when they ain't millionaires i should have your trouble abe commented i got enough abe believe me max rejoined everything i gotta look after myself my credit man leaves me next week and i got other worries besides that one too sure i know abe said as they started for the smoker of the 610 and the biggest one you got only yourself to blame for it what do you mean abe max asked i mean this max abe declared i'm knowing you now since twenty years already and if i'm buttoned in you could know it ain't because i'm fresh you understand but because i got your interests at heart that boy of yours goes too far max max drew a cigar from his waistcoat pocket and carefully bit off the end how so he inquired well in a whole lot of ways max abe continued after they were seated and mind you i know it ain't none of my business max but when i see that boy come into hammersmith's today and eat for five dollars a lunch with a bottle of champagne wine yet max i couldn't help myself i gotta say something max scowled and spat out the end of his cigar of course max abe added using his partner's metaphor it ain't no skin off my nose you understand ain't it max growled as he turned on abe with a menacing glare well it's a wonder it ain't the way you're sticking it into other people's business if you think i care what you think about what my boy eats for lunch you are making a big mistake i could take care of my own boy potash and i'm just as much obliged if you would do the same abe flushed a fiery red and rose to his feet i guess i'd go into the next car he said you could go a whole lot farther for all i care max retorted and immediately buried his head between the open pages of a conservative evening paper abe had not offended in vain however for after dinner that night when sidney sought his father in the coblins suite at riesenberger's cottage the king was in an ugly mood say pop sidney began how about you for a twenty till saturday night what do you mean max bellowed ain't i given you ten dollars only this morning sidney laughed uncomfortably ain't you the old tightwad he said max's reply to this observation was quite unprecedented in all sidney's experience it took the form of an open-handed blow on the cheek the first ever administered by his indulgent parent since sidney's infancy forthwith began a family row that brought the entire household guests servants and proprietress on the run to the coblin apartments when mrs coblin's frightened screams had ceased and max coblin had calmed down sufficiently to offer an evasive explanation the guests trooped back to the piazza and three games of auction pinochle which had started in the dining-room after the tables had been cleared came to an abrupt close instead the players foregathered with the other guests in the porch rockers there they discussed the incident until nearly midnight and as no one had been an eye-witness of the affray there were as many versions of it as may be mathematically demonstrated where one blow is struck among three persons some had it that sidney had attacked his father and others that mrs coblin had assaulted sidney but a large feminine majority favored a construction of the matter as one of wife beating abe alone correctly surmised the turn that sidney's affairs had taken and he sat on the piazza in conscience-stricken solitude 
long after all the other guests had retired. He blamed himself for the entire affair, and he smoked cigar after cigar before he sought his bed. As he walked up the broad staircase, he met Max Koblen at the first landing. Max, he said, where are you going this time of night? Max stopped short, his eyes blazed in a face so careworn and haggard that to Abe he seemed to have aged ten years since their meeting that afternoon. This is what becomes of your butting in, Max cried bitterly. The boy went out right after we had the fuss and he had come back. He paused to choke down a hysterical lump in his throat. And God knows what's become of him, he sobbed as he continued down the stairs. Abe tossed on his pillow all night, and when at breakfast he learned that Sidney Coblin had not returned, he swallowed with difficulty a cup of coffee and left a steak, two eggs, and a plate of French fried potatoes entirely untasted. Thus he was enabled to catch the 7.5 instead of the 7.30 train. When he found himself at the 34th Street Ferry with almost half an hour to spare, he determined to walk to the store. He trudged across 34th Street with his hands in his pockets and his head bent toward the pavement, a prey to the most bitter reflections. And as he turned the corner of Fifth Avenue, he failed to notice walking in the opposite direction, a tall youth, well-dressed save for soiled linen. The latter's eyes showed traces of unmistakable tears, and as they too were bent upon the pavement, there ensued a violent collision, which almost threw Abe off his feet. "'Why don't you look where you're going?' he began, and then he recognized the object of his wrath. "'Sidney!' he yelled clutching young Koblen's shoulder. Where are you going? Let me alone, Sidney cried, as he sought to free himself. Of a Sidney, he pleaded. You mustn't act so strange with me. Did you get any breakfast yet? Sidney shook his head sullenly. Me neither, Abe cried. Come on over to the Waldorf. Five minutes later, they sat at a table in the palm room, while Abe ordered two whole portions of grapefruit, a double portion of tenderloin steak, souffle potatoes, coffee, waffles, and honey. Now listen to me, Sidney, he began. You shouldn't get so mad at your father just because he licks you once it. You understand? My poor father, Selig, he knocks the face off of me regularly, twice a week, and I ain't none the worse for it. Sidney hung his head and made no reply. Furthermore, Sidney, Abe went on, if you broke, why don't you say so? He pulled a roll of bills out of his pocket and handed Sidney twenty dollars. Just alone for a few days, you understand? He said, as the waiter brought in a loaded tray. Or a year, what's the difference, ain't it? Now, let's get busy. Together they polished off the entire trayful of food, and when Abe leaned back, the waiter presented a check for ten dollars and eighty cents. Cheap at this price, Abe remarked as he added a generous tip to the amount of the bill. And now, Sidney, I suppose you're going back to the store? No, I ain't, Sidney said. I ain't doing no good down there, so what's the use? The old man won't let me do nothing down there. They all think I'm a joke. Well, you see, Sidney, Abe commented, that's the way it goes. It's an old saying, but a true one. There's no profit for a feller in his own country. And what's more, Sidney continued, they ain't giving me a chance, neither. What I want to do is to sell goods on the road. Sure, I know, Abe interrupted. Every young fellow wants to go on the road. All they can see in it is riding in parlor cars and playing auction pinochle in four-dollar-a-day hotels. Believe me, Sidney, selling goods on the road, when you've been at it so long as I am, it's a dog's life. And as for auction pinochle, that's poison for a salesman. Auction pinochle is nothing to me. Sidney declared. I swore off. Another thing is lunches, Sidney, Abe went on. Ain't it funny thing what a lot of satisfaction it is when you're eating Zweiback and a cup of coffee for lunch. In the first place, all it's costing you is ten cents and you feel like a prince. Many a big bill of goods I sold on Zweiback and coffee, Sidney. Crackers and milk, too. And now, 
Sidney, the best thing you could do is to go back and tell your old man you're through with auction pinnacle and high-priced lunches, and you want him he should give you a show. You should sell goods. Again, Sidney shook his head. It ain't no use, Mr. Potash, Sidney declared. Pop ain't got no confidence in me. If I was a greenhorn, fresh from the old country, he might let me start in and do something, but... At the word greenhorn, Abe Potash leaned forward and struck the table with his open hand. By Jiminy, Sidney, he cried, I know the very job for you. Only one thing I must gotta say to you, Sidney, you have gotta commence small. So if what you're saying about auction pinochle and other monkey business goes, Sidney, all right. Otherwise the thing is off. Sure it goes, Mr. Potash, Sidney cried. Abe looked the heir apparent squarely in the eye for two minutes, and then he struck the table again. I believe you, Sidney, he said, and we will right away take the car down to West Washington Place. Catsburg in shop occupied the top floor of an old private house, but what their place of business lacked in size, it made up in activity. Pressing irons were sizzling and banging, and sewing machines were burring loudly as Abe and Sidney climbed the stairs. When they entered, Shaponik, the butterfly of fashion, had once more assumed the chrysalis of his working clothes. "'How do you do, Mr. Potash?' he cried, all in one breath. "'Excuse me, I'm looking like a slob. We are busy like dogs here. Catsburg, he yelled. "'Kim and see here on.' In response, a stout figure clad only in an undershirt, trousers, and a pair of carpet slippers, laid down a pressing iron and shuffled toward the visitors. My partner, Mr. Katzberg, Shapolnik announced. He also looks like a slop, Mr. Potash, but when we were getting partitions in and our office fixed up, no one would see him at all. He's the inside man, and me, I'm in the office and showroom. We're going to have a showroom so soon as we're settled. A safe, too. A telephone. We already got it. This is Mr. Potash Katzberg and the other gentleman. I don't know at all. Mr. Koblen, Abe explained. He's coming to work by you as a salesman. A salesman? Katzberg exclaimed. Why, we don't want no. Shapolnik turned on him with a glare. Katzberg, he said. Them samples you're working on. We got to show the magnet store this afternoon yet. Katzberg shrugged his shoulders and returned to his pressing, while Shaponik drew forward two rickety chairs and a packing box. "'Have a seat, Mr. Potash, and Mr. Cohen, too,' he said. "'Koblen,' Abe corrected. "'Koblen,' Shaponik repeated. "'Excuse me.' He went to a closet in the corner, and, unlocking it, he exposed the fashionable suit that he had worn at Potash and Perlmutter's the previous afternoon. From the right-hand waistcoat pocket, he took a red-banded invincible and handed it to Abe. Have a smoke, Mr. Potash, he said. Abe examined the cigar closely and tucked it carefully away. Then he produced three panatellas, handed one each to Sidney and Shaponik, and lit the other himself. About this here salesman, Mr. Potash, Shaponik commented, I think I changed my mind. Abe blew a great cloud of smoke before replying, and then he placed an emphatic forefinger upon Shaponik's knee. A new beginner, when he throws bluffs, Shaponik, he said, has got to make good. You told me yesterday you wanted a salesman, and I'm bringing him to you. Shaponik blushed. Sure, I know I told it to you, Mr. Potash, he said, but my partner thinks otherwise. Abe nodded. The only use some people got it for a partner, Shaponik, he commented, is they could always blame him for everything they do. But even if you did come in my place just to show me what an elegant suit of clothes and a fine clean shave he got at Shaponik, I'm bringing you a salesman anyhow. Katzberg, at this juncture, again laid down his pressing iron and came forward. Say, looky here, what's the use talking? he cried. We don't need a salesman and that's all there is to it. "'It's enough, Katzberg,' Abe shouted. "'You got a whole lot much to say for yourself for a new beginner. "'I ain't saying you need a salesman, Katzberg. "'I'm only saying that you're going to hire one, Katzberg, "'and after you hire one, you will quick need him.' "'Abe placed his hand on Sidney's shoulder. 
here's a young fellow what she ain't gonna gamble or to fool away his time he's gonna sell goods he declared he works for years by the biggest raincoat house in the country he's got an acquaintance among the retail clothing trade which it is easy worth to you twenty-five dollars a week in the regular commissions but we couldn't afford to pay no salesman twenty-five dollars a week Shapolnik exclaimed try me just one week sidney said and i'll bring in enough cash to pay my salary i forgot to say abe interrupted that he's also got a lot of confidence in himself maybe i have sidney retorted but i'm going to make good certainly you are he added rising from his chair and now catsburg the whole thing is settled catsburg shrugged and extended one palm outward in a gesture of despair seemingly we're not our own bosses here he said seemingly not abe rejoined but just the same if you will take on this young fellow for a salesman i will give you a guarantee it that i will make good all you would lose on him for the first three months is my word good enough sure it is shaponek cried when will you come to work by us mr coblin this morning abe answered for sydney right now and one thing I must got to you say, Sidney, before I go. Stand in your own shoes, and don't try to excuse yourself on account you got a rich father. Also, if the old man makes you an offer, you should come back to him. Turn it down. Take it from me, Sidney. You got a big future here. With a parting handshake, all around, Abe started back to his place of business. Five minutes later, he boarded a Broadway car, and when he alighted at 19th Street, he picked his way through a jam of vehicles, which completely blocked that narrow thoroughfare. As he was about to set foot on the sidewalk, he caught sight of the gray, drawn countenance of the Raincoat King, who sat beside his chauffeur on the front seat of a touring car. "'Say, Max,' Abe cried, "'I want to speak to you a few words something.' Max Koblen turned his head and recognized Abe with a start. What do you want from me? He said huskily. I want to tell you the boy's all right, Abe replied. The color surged to Max's face, and he leaped wildly from the automobile. What do you mean, all right? He gasped. I mean, all right in every way, Max, Abe answered. And if you would step into Hammersmith's for a minute, they'll tell you all about it. Where is he? Max cried. Abe led the way to a table. He's where he should have been shown long since already, he said as they sat down. He's got a job and he's going to make good on it. What are you talking nonsense? Max exploded. Where's my Sidney? His mother is pretty near crazy. She shouldn't worry, Abe replied calmly. The boy's coming home tonight. And if I would be you, Max, I would see to it he pays anyhow eight dollars a week board. Once more, Max grew white, with anger this time. "'Jokes you're making with me,' he bellowed. "'Tell me where my boy is quick, or I'll—' "'Cush, Max,' Abe interrupted. "'You're making a fool of yourself. I ain't hiding you, boy. Just listen a few minutes, and I'll tell you all about it.' Forthwith, he unfolded to Max a vivid narrative of that morning's adventures. When he concluded, Max had grown somewhat calmer. But potash, he protested. I don't want the boy he should work by somebody else. Let him come and sell goods by me. He couldn't do it, and you couldn't neither, Max, Abe said. If he goes back to you, Max, you couldn't change the way you've been treating that boy ever since he was born, and he sure would go back to the way he's been acting. Let the boy stay where he is, Max. Say, looky here, potash, Max burst out. What are you buttoning into my affairs for? I ain't competent to manage my own son. Abe deemed it the part of friendship to remain silent. But Max misconstrued his residence. Oh, he exclaimed. I see the whole business now. You got an interest in this here pants factory, and so you practically kidnapped my son. You know what I think? I think you're trying to jolly me into letting him stay there because you expect maybe I would invest some money in the business. For two minutes, Abe gulped convulsively and blinked at the Raincoat King in stunned amazement. Then he rose slowly to his feet. 
all right coblin he said i heard enough from you i wash myself of the entire matter for my part you and your son can go to the devil and take it from me it won't be your fault if he don't when abe entered the firm's showroom that morning it was nearly half past eleven and morris perlmutter sat behind the pages of the daily cloak and suit record in a sulky perusal of the arrival of buyers column before he looked up he permitted abe to discard his coat for an office jacket you was taking a sea bath abe he said at length ain't it i suppose we'd pretty soon got to close up the store so as you can take all the sea baths you want what abe refrained from uttering a suitable rejoinder and made straight for the office morris he yelled ain't the safe open yet never mind is a safe open or not abe morris replied so long as you're attending to business the way you're all abe it ain't necessary the safe should be opened abe grunted and squatted down in front of the combination at length the big doors swung open and he drew the box of cigars out of the middle compartment morris looked on with ill-concealed curiosity while abe took a banded invincible from his waistcoat pocket and restored it to the box whence it originally came what's all that for morris asked that is a souvenir from a pleasant morning abe replied as he thrust the box of cigars back into the safe and slammed the doors he was about to return to the showroom when the telephone bell rang and morris took the receiver from the hook hello yes this is potash and perlmutter he's right here abe max coblin wants to talk to you he does eh abe replied well i don't want to talk to him you should tell him that yourself morris said as he walked away from the telephone i ain't got nothing to do with your quarrels abe watched morris disappear into the showroom and then he ran to the telephone and slammed the receiver onto the hook with force sufficient almost to wreck the instrument at intervals of a few seconds the telephone rang for more than half an hour fifteen minutes after it had ceased the elevator door opened and max coblin entered cutthroat coblin exclaimed i rung up my son and he wouldn't come back you're turning him against me you and them other two crooks you think you get my money out of me very well i'll show you i ain't through with you yet i'll put you fellas where you belong don't make no threats coblin abe said calmly because in the first place you couldn't scare me any and in the second place if you think i'm trying to keep your boy away from you you're mistaken that's all i already wasted a whole morning on him and just to show you I ain't such a crook as you think i am i'd go right down there now and if i got to do it i'd drag that young loafer out of there by the hair of his head twenty minutes later abe burst into Catsburg and shop's business premises and asked in loud tones for sidney coblin before the astonished Chaponik could reply max coblin who had followed abe on the next car arrived all breathless and panted a similar demand he ain't in now Chaponik replied he's just going to his lunch what do you mean talking to me on the phone the way you did this morning max shouted you ain't got no business to keep my boy from me i ain't keeping your boy from you Chaponik answered and i would speak to you whichever way i would want who are you anyway cush Chaponik abe interrupted you're talking too fresh mr coblin is right you should fire that young fellow right away cause i'm telling you right here and now i wouldn't guarantee nothing for him after this what do i care what you would guarantee or what you wouldn't guarantee Chaponik replied the young fellow already sold for us this morning for five hundred dollars a bill of goods and he could stay with us so to not just as he wants furthermore mr potash i don't give a snap of my fingers for your guarantee this is my shop if you don't want to stay here you don't gotta he seized the pressing iron in token that the interview was ended and abe and max started for the stairs without another word as they reached the sidewalk abe paused across the street a dairy lunchroom displayed its white enamel sign and through the plate glass window he thought he discerned a familiar figure he ran to the opposite sidewalk and entered the restaurant closely followed by max just as Sidney Coblin was eating the last crumbs of a portion of Zweiback and coffee. 
hello sydney abe said what's the matter with you why don't you go back to your father sydney rose to his feet and looked first at abe and then at the raincoat king what for he asked nonchalantly because he asks you to abe replied and because i didn't got no right to butt in the way i did sydney after all your father is your father what's biting you now sydney exclaimed ain't you told me this morning i should do what i did abe nodded sadly and didn't you say me and the old man couldn't give each other a square deal if we wanted to abe nodded again then i'm going to stick to my job sydney declared as he walked toward the cashier's desk abe and max trailed after him and when they reached the sidewalk max seized his son by the arm sydney laban he said listen to me come and eat anyhow a decent lunch and we'll talk things over what for sydney said i've had as much as i want to eat and besides i've got to see a fellow up at the prince clarence hotel i'll be at Riesenberger's to dinner tonight about the usual time oh you will will you max cried well all i got to say to you is you got to pay for it yourself sydney broke into a laugh that worries me a whole lot he said i've made enough out of my commissions today already to pay a whole week's board down there he turned and started across the street but as he reached the curb he paused tell mamma she shouldn't worry herself he said i'm all right max looked at abe with a sickly grin i think he is too abe he murmured would you come over to broadway and maybe take a little lunch with me Zweiback and coffee's good enough for me abe replied max linked his arm in abe's you shouldn't be mad at me abe he said sadly i'm all turned upside down about that boy and if zweiback and coffee is good enough for you and him abe i guess it must be too good for me but just the same i'm going to eat with you abe and we'll let bygones be bygones it was some weeks before abe could bring himself to recount to morris the full details of sidney coblin's regeneration but morris had learned the facts long before there appeared in the advertising section of the clothing and haberdashery magazine the following full-page advertisement catsburg shop and coblin announced the opening of their new office and showroom in the chicksaw building west fourth street new york makers of trousers for finicky folks a headliner the rain shed pants manufactured from the famous rainproof fabric coblinet keeps the legs warm and dry spring line now ready it caught morris's eye one morning in january and he read it over not without envy some people's got all the luck abe he said bitterly i bet you abe replied without looking up from his order book which was overflowing with requisitions for spring garments i bet you morris you take my rosie for instance at her age you got no idea what a sport she is yesterday afternoon she went to a bridge whist party by mrs coblin's and she won a sterling solid silver fern dish and mind you morris she only just found out how to play the game who learned her morris asked mrs klinger and mrs ellenbogen abe replied that's two fine women morris particularly mrs ellenbogen end of section five section six of abe and morris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. abe and morris being further adventures of potash and perlmutter by montague glass chapter five a return to arcady part one yes abe morris perlmutter said with bitter emphasis max kirschner steals away trade from under our noses while you fool away your time selling goods to a fellow like sam green what do you mean fool away my time abe cried indignantly sam green is an old customer from ours 
and if henry feigenbaum gives for a couple of hundred dollars an order to max kirschner he only does it because he's got pity on the old man and anyhow morris even if sam green is a little slow you understand sooner or later we get our money ain't it sure i know abe and if them sooner or later fellows would pay you once in a while sooner abe it'd be all right you understand but they don't abe they always pay you later well sam has got some pretty stiff competition up there morris abe said in the first place cyprus is too near syracuse you understand and if one of them yokels wants to buy for thirty dollars a garment for his wife if he's up to date he goes to syracuse and if he's a back number he goes to sam's competitors what's the name now of uh, van buskirk and patterson yes morris back numbers always buys from back numbers why don't we sell that van buster concern our line abe a fine chance i got it with them people morris abe exclaimed they buy their whole stock from a jobber in buffalo and they got an idea that russian blouses is the latest up to the minute effects and garments and you couldn't blame em morris most of the women up in cyprus thinks that way too it ain't here near there abe morris interrupted sam green is one of them fellows which he is slow to pay even if he'd be worth a million even he's got that habit abe look what he writes us now he handed abe a letter which read as follows samuel green dry goods and notions the k and m self shape corset cypress new york april one nineteen ten gents your favor of the thirteenth in stance mensa received and contents noted and in reply would say you should be so kind and wait a couple of days and i will send you a check sure on an account i got sickness in the family and oblige yours truly s green well morris abe commented mindful of a recent obstinate lumbago might the fellow did get sickness in his family maybe schmooze abe morris cried impatiently every season that fellow's got another excuse last fall his wife goes to work and has an operation a year ago he's got his uncle in the hospital the winter before that he's got funeral expenses on account his mother died on him and so it goes abe that fellow would a damn sight sooner kill off his whole family you understand than pay a bill to the day is due all right abe said then we wouldn't sell him no more that's all morris shrugged that's all he repeated a concern don't pay strictly to the day so he couldn't sell him no more and that's all socked here yeah. for a fellow which he's losing customers right and left to a back number like max kirschner abe you're talking pretty independent say looky here morris abe exploded i just told it you max kirschner only gets that order from henry feigenbaum because he takes pity on him what do you mean pity morris retorted i seen max kirschner in a subway this morning and he looks like he needs pity abe he's got diamonds stuck on him like a pawnbroker's widow that's all right morris abe continued some drummers has got diamonds and some has got bank accounts but there's mighty few got both morris and max kirschner ain't one of em one thing you gotta remember morris max is an old man what are you talking nonsense an old man morris exclaimed max has just turned sixty sure i know abe commented and for a drummer that's awful old morris a fellow which he spends six months out of the year in trains and hotels morris has got to be mighty particular about what he eats i stopped in one hotel together with max shown many times already and at dinner i'm always eating steaks and once in a while eggs maybe but max goes for them french names every time Many a night I watch Max in a hotel lobby, and you can see by his face that his stomach is boiling. Never mind, Abe. I could stand a little indigestion, too, Abe, if I would be getting the orders Max is getting it. That's a thing of the past, Morris, Abe replied. Business falls off something terrible with him, Morris, and the first thing you know, Morris, Klinger and Klein gets rid of him, and then Diamonds would gotta come in handy before he finds another job yeah i'll clinger and klein we get rid of him morris cried skeptically max kirschner ain't no ordinary drummer abe there's a fellow he was born and raised on this side he's a gentleman abe and them boys respect him besides abe he practically started them two greenhorns in business twenty years ago when them boys was new beginners kirschner brings him in good trade you understand and not only that abe if it would be for him them fellows wouldn't never lasted six months 
the first season they turned out a lot of stickers when they get short max goes himself to old man baum and gets him to lend them boys a thousand dollars people don't forget such things in a hurry abe don't they morris abe rejoined well maybe they do and maybe they don't morris but twenty years ago is a long time to remember things morris and when a fellow draws big wages like max kirshner he's got to turn in the orders morris otherwise pass favors is nix morris nodded that's no lie either abe he said rising to his feet and we should right away send sam green a letter either he should mail us a check or we should put his account on a collection agency that fellow goes too far abe it was precisely a week later that max kirshner's relations with the firm of klinger and klein finally reached their climax yes morris abe said as he entered the showroom after a brief visit to the barber shop that morning what did i told you you didn't tell me nothing abe morris retorted and besides it was my idea that we wrote him a rotten letter otherwise we would wait for another week or ten days for our check as it is abe he deducts four dollars on us for a damage on account of bum packing he's not only a crook abe but a liar also four dollars wouldn't break us morris abe rejoined and we could easy make it up on the next bill he buys from us but i wasn't talking about sam green at all i mean max kirshner i much bother my head about kirshner morris said let klinger and klein worry about him abe grunted as he removed his hat and coat you'd wait an awful long time for klinger and klein to worry about him morris he said because them fellows got such hearts which got so hurtin their wives would die together with their children in one day yet i'm only saying you understand them two suckers wouldn't worry neither saturday night they fired max kirshner like a dog morris and why because a week ago max eats some stuss in bridgetown you understand which he sick in bed for three days and while he's laid up yet samet brothers cops out a thousand dollar order on him i give up morris cried with ready sympathy you don't tell me and now that poor fellow walks the streets looking for a job and a fine show he's got it an old man like him don't say that again abe morris said you jonah the fellow that way somebody hears you saying max is an old man and the first thing you know abe they believe he's old i told you before max is only sixty and when my gross father sally was sixty he got married for the third time yet sure i know morris abe retorted some fellows get married for a wife and some for a nurse morris any cripple could get married you understand but a fellow must gotta have his health to sell goods he seized the current issue of the daily cloak and suit record and as he sat down to examine it he heaved a sigh which merged into an agonized groan oi he exclaimed that lumbago still gets me in the back you see abe morris commented maliciously he ain't so young yourself from forty-eight to sixty he ain't a thousand years neither abe abe scowled and then his face lightened up in the conception of a happy idea i give you right about that morris he said but with me it's different morris if i get so i couldn't go out on the road you understand we could always hire someone to go out for us could we morris grumbled sure abe went on and even today yet while i'm making denver and the coast towns it wouldn't harm us we should get a fella which is acquainted with the trade up the state in pennsylvania and ohio wouldn't it morris croaked we're losing every day business morris because i got such a big territory to cover abe said a fella in a small town wants his fall goods early just so much as one of them big concerns in denver or to seattle and if i don't show up in time they place their orders with someone else whereas morris if we could wait a couple of weeks we would say for instance until he finds out that every one ain't paying fancy salaries like klinger and klein you understand for a couple of thousand dollars a year morris we could get max kirshner and max kirshner morris yelled what do you mean max kirshner yes morris abe said we could get max kirshner and even if he would be a little cronkly once in a while sometimes maybe he would be worth to us two thousand a year anyhow two thousand a year morris bellowed 
what the devil are you talking nonsense abe we should give two thousand a year to a cripple like kirshner or do you think you're running here anyhow a cloak and suit business or a home for the aged if you want to give charity do it with your money not mine for the remainder of the forenoon morris perlmutter moved about the showroom with his face distorted in so gloomy a scowl that to abe it seemed as though a fog enveloped his partner through which there darted like flashes of heat lightning exclamations of schnorrer cripple with my money yet and crest that fella got it at length he put on his hat and went out to lunch while abe gazed after him in mute disgust when some people talk charity he grumbled you gotta reckon a hundred percent discount for cash you see abe morris cried as he came in from lunch how easy it is to misjudge people i just seen saul Klinger over to hammersmith's and he tells me that in six weeks yet max kirshner falls down on three orders four thousand dollars that sucker leon samick hops out on him and saul couldn't help himself abe either they gotta fire max or they go out of business abe nodded slowly his face possessed an unusual pallor and he clenched an unlighted cigar between his teeth what is it morris asked don't you feel good i'm feeling fine morris he replied huskily i could blow myself to a bottle of champagne wine yet i feel so good i'm enjoying myself morris on account mo greaseman from syracuse was just in here which he tells me his nephew mozart rabiner goes to work for klinger and klein as a drummer and we should be so good and cancel the order which he gives us yesterday as blood is redder as water and what the devil could we do about it anyway morris's jaw dropped and he sat down heavily in the nearest chair one thing i'm glad morris abe said as he put on his hat i'm glad if we got to lose mo greaseman's trade morris that he's going to give it to a fellow like sol klinger which he's such a good friend to you morris and got such a big heart he jammed his hat on his ears and started out. "'Where are you going, Abe?' Morris asked. "'I'm going over to Hammersmith's, Morris,' he replied, "'to get a bite to eat, and I hope to see Saul Klinger there, Morris, as I would like to congratulate him, Morris, with a pressing iron.' Morris's face settled once more into a deep frown as the elevator door closed behind his partner. "'Always with his mouth he's making somebody a blue eye,' he muttered as he turned to sorting over the sample line against abe's impending trip to the small towns up the state he had picked out four cheap showy garments when the elevator door clanged again and a visitor entered bearing a brown paper parcel well morris he said what's the good word the newcomer's cheery greeting was strangely at variance with his manner which was as diffident as that of a village dog on the fourth of july as he advanced toward the showroom he exhaled the odor of mothballs characteristic of an old stock of cloaks and suits so that before he looked up morris was able to identify his visitor hello sam he said when'd you get in twelve o'clock sam replied I would have got sooner, but a crook of a scalper in Syracuse sells me a ticket which it's punched out as far as Canandaiga, and if it wouldn't be I paid four dollars extra I come pretty near getting kicked off the train. You ain't nothing out, Sam, Morris said, because that's just the amount you're doing me for in our last bill. Doing you for? Sam cried. What do you mean, doing you for? One garment was damaged in the packaging, which I deducted the four dollars, and if you wouldn't believe me, here it is now. He unwrapped the brown paper parcel and disclosed a crumpled article of women's apparel, which Morris shook out and examined critically. In the first place, Sam, he commented, the garment has been worn. What are you talking nonsense, worn? Sam protested. Once, only my layer put it on to see the damage. There it is. Sam pointed with his finger, and Morris looked at the spot indicated. "'Well, how could that be damaged in packaging, Sam?' Morris said indignantly. "'That's a stain from a auction soup.' "'My wife must got to eat like any other woman,' 
sam exclaimed indignantly and besides morris the stain ain't all soup you understand some of it gets wet in the packing case well i wouldn't bother my head about it no more morris retorted i deposited your check just now and we're all lucky if you would deduct four dollars that we got our money at all maybe you are maybe you ain't morris sam commented that's when i come down to see you about what do you mean morris cried i mean said sam in husky tones i don't know whether the check is good at all when i mailed it you i got a little balance at my bank but yesterday afternoon the president sends for me and shuts down on my accommodation and maybe i don't know whether he did or did not you understand he takes my balance on account morris laid down the garment and fixed his visitor with an angry glare so he exploded you're gonna fail on us sam disclaimed it indignantly what do you think i am he demanded a crook and besides i ain't got nothing to fail with morris drew forward a chair sam sat down and leaning back he nursed his cheek with his hand in an attitude of utter dejection well, what are you going to do morris asked that's what i come down here to find out sam replied then ensued a silence of several minutes during which morris gazed attentively at his customer the fact is sam he said at last you ain't got no head sam nodded sadly you're a fool sam morris went on in kindly accents and no matter how hard a fool would work he's a poor man all his life sam deemed it hardly worth while to acquiesce in this statement but he endorsed it unconsciously with a large tear which stole put of the corner of his eye and worked a clean groove down one travel-stained cheek have a smoke sam morris added hastily as he thrust a cigar toward his late customer did you get your lunch yet no come on out with me now and we'll have a little bite to eat he jumped to his feet and seized his hat nathan he bawled to the shipping clerk tell mr potash i'm going out with a customer and i'll be back when i'm here max kirshner had reached the age of sixty without making a single enemy save his stomach which at length ungratefully rejected all the rich favors that max had bestowed on it so long and so generously indeed he was reduced to a diet of crackers and milk when abe encountered him in hammersmith's restaurant that september morning hello max abe cried when did you get back i thought you was in one of them now uh, sanatoriums a sanatorium is no place for a drummer to find a job abe max replied a good salesman like you could find a job anywhere without much trouble max abe said cheerfully that's what everybody says abe meantime i'm loafing wouldn't be for long max abe rejoined as he cast a hungry eye over hammersmith's bill of fare how's that fillet de who's this with asparagus tips and mushrooms for a brief moment max's eye gleamed and then grew dull again it's fine to put the stomach out of business abe max said take the tip from one who has lost sixty pounds ten customers and a good job all in six weeks and ordered the poached eggs on toast abe compromised on boiled beef with horseradish sauce and when he was well into the noisy consumption of that simple dish he broached the subject of max's future plans when do you think you'll go to work again max he asked max shrugged expressively i'm not a prophet abe i'm a salesman he said well there ain't no particular hurry max it ain't the same like you had got a family to look out for i've been a drummer all my life abe max declared and a drummer has no right to be married when i was a kid i had a chance to go into the store of a couple of yokels of state in the town where i was born and raised and i guess if i'd done so i'd been married and had a whole family of children by now maybe you're just as well off max abe said consolingly children is a gamble anyhow max 
the boys as assets and the girls as liabilities and if you got a large family of girls you're practically bankrupt no matter how good business would be don't you believe it abe max said those two yokels both had big families and they didn't do such a big business either but they managed to make a good living and last week i hear they sold out to some city dry goods man for forty thousand dollars abe paused with a loaded knife in mid-air forty thousand dollars between two ain't much max he said eh, it's more than i got anyhow max rejoined as he rose to his feet you got lots of time to make money max abe concluded come round and see us when you get time won't you max nodded as he walked down the street to make a further canvas of the garment trade he passed the broad windows of the dairy lunchroom where morris was regaling sam green with a popular price meal yes sam morris said as he caught sight of max kirshner's dejected figure you're lucky when you consider some people you're still a young man and it ain't too late for you to start as a new beginner somewhere a young man could always make a living anyhow sure sam agreed but why should i start in as a new beginner morris i already got an established business you understand if i could get a fellow with a headpiece morris never mind he ain't got so much money with a couple of thousand dollars we could run that fellow from syracuse out of town what fellow from syracuse morris asked ain't i told you sam continued i thought i says that the reason the bank shuts down on me is a fellow from syracuse buys out them two suckers van buskirk and patterson he's going to operate the store as a branch house morris nodded his head slowly so sam he said you're up against one of them sharks from syracuse oh, i'm afraid you got a dead proposition in that store of yours two cups of coffee had revived sam green's ambition however and he laughed aloud you don't understand them people up in cyprus morris he said strangers they don't like it all and even me though i lived in that town ten years most of em wouldn't buy goods off of me because van buskirk and patterson was born and raised in that town and they dealt with em ever since they was boys together so you see i got ten years start on that fellow from syracuse morris if i can get some fella which he knows the garment business to go as partners together with me and to put a little money into the store we could yet do a good business there how much money would you gotta have morris asked two thousand dollars anyhow sam replied morris tapped the table with his right index finger and frowned reflectively the necktie pin alone must be worth a thousand dollars he murmured almost to himself and two rings he got it which i know about must stand him in anyhow a thousand dollars more he thrust back his chair and rose to his feet all right sam he said aloud you got a little egg in your chin wipe it off and we'll go back to the store i got an idea on second thought sam morris said as they approached potash and pearl mutter's place of business i wouldn't go up with me if i was you on account i don't want to say nothing to my partner just yet a while where you staying sam i got a room at a hotel over on third avenue sam replied third avenue morris exclaimed that's a nachbar shaft for a business man he handed sam a five-dollar bill go and get yourself a room with the prince clarence morris said i'll be over there presently nathan the shipping clerk was alone in the showroom when morris entered ain't my partner come back yet nathan he demanded nathan shook his head then tell him when he does come back that i went up to the prince clarence to see a customer morris continued and if he asks what name tell him it's new concern just starting five minutes later he visited the business premises of kleinman and ellenbogen impelled thereto by a process of reasoning which involved the following points klinger and klein manufactured a medium-priced line and so did kleinman and ellenbogen klinger and klein's leader was the girl in the airship gown a title suggested by the syndicate's popular musical comedy of that name while kleinman and ellenbogen advertised their strongest garment as the girl in the motorboat out of compliment of course to the equally popular musical comedy recently produced by an anti-syndicated manager both concerns catered to the same class of trade 
and when either of the partners of Klinger and Klein referred in conversation to a member of the firm of Kleinman and Ellenbogen, or vice versa, sucker was the mildest epithet employed. Hence, Morris Perlmutter argued that Max Kirschner would resort to Kleinman and Ellenbogen's loft for comfort and advice as he stepped out of the elevator. His surmise was confirmed by a nimbus emanating from the necktie of a person seated at the far end of the showroom. "'Hello, Max!' Morris cried. "'Who'd thought of seeing you here?' Max rose to his feet and extended his right hand in greeting, whereas Morris noted that the four-carat diamond still sparkled on Max's finger. "'I just left your partner over at Hammersmith's, Morris,' Max said. "'Sure, I know,' Morris rejoined. That fella makes a god out of his stomach, Max. But it ain't here nor there. Did you get something to do yet, Max? I've got a whole lot to do trying to find a job, Morris, if that's what you mean, Max replied. Morris glanced around the showroom, but both Kleiman and Ellenbogen were absent. Where are they? Morris asked. Out to lunch, I guess, Max replied. Good, Morris exclaimed. Them suckers would like to know everybody's business. You got a few minutes' time, Max? nothing but time max replied sadly then come uptown a few blocks with me morris said i got a proposition to make you max shrugged his shoulders and put on his hat yes max morris continued as they walked toward the prince clarence hotel i got a proposition to make you but first i would like to ask you something a question fire away max said what had you done with that other diamond ring which you used to wear the big one I have it home, Max replied. What do you want to know for? I want to lend you some money on it, Morris went on, calmly. Also that pin which you got it, and that there ring. I want to lend you three thousand dollars on em. Three thousand dollars? Max exclaimed. Why, the whole outfit isn't worth two. What do I care? Morris rejoined. It's only a loan, and I bet you'd quick pay me back. Max paused on the sidewalk and stared. What's the matter, Morris? Are you sick? Must a fella got to be sick to want to help you out, Max? Morris said. And anyhow, Max, it's as much a favor to us as it is to you. By this time they had reached the Prince Clarence Hotel, and Morris led the way to the cafe. Say, looky here, Max, the whole thing is this, he said, after they were seated. I'm going to lend you three thousand dollars to go into business with a fellow which he got a store in a small town upstate. And you're going to do it. Max shook his head. No, I ain't, he answered. I'm too old a dog to learn new tricks. If you sell good wholesale, you could sell in retail, Morris declared. So if you listen to me, I'll tell you what the proposition is. Forthwith, Morris unfolded to Max the history of Sam Green's mercantile establishment. And now, after all them years, Max... He concluded, that fella gets practically run out of town because his bank shuts down on him. What's the name of the place? Max asked. The name of the place, Morris repeated. Yes, Max said. The name of the town where the fellow comes from. Morris scratched his head for a minute. I should remember the name of very little one-horse town we got customers, he said. The name of the place don't matter, Max. It's got two thousand people living in it and practically only one store. Because the way Sam Green is running his business now, you couldn't call it a store at all. Max rose from the table. I'll tell you the truth, Morris, he said. What's the use wasting our time? The proposition ain't attractive. I was born and raised in a one-horse town upstate. And even though I ain't been back for twenty years, I know what it's like. You'll have to excuse me. But Max... Morris commenced. I needn't tell you that I'm more than grateful to you, Morris, Max concluded. And if ever I want to dispose of my diamonds, you shall have first chance. He shook Morris's limp and unresisting hand and returned at once to the showroom of Kleiman and Ellenbogen. Anyone come for me, Miss Cashman? He asked the bookkeeper, who was busily engaged in the preparation of the firm's monthly statement. "'Say, looky here, Kirshner. Louis Kleinman called from his office. "'Leave the girl alone, can't you? She's got enough to do, tending to our business.' 
I'm only asking her if she has any word for me, Max replied. I don't care what you're asking her, Kleinman said, as he came out of his office to confront Max. You are acting altogether too fresh around here, Kirshner. You pay rent here or to what? Max made no reply. And furthermore, Kleinman continued, we got business to attend here, Kirshner, and we couldn't afford to have no dead ones hanging around. For a brief interval, he scowled at Max, who turned on his heel and made for the elevator without another word. His applications for employment during the past few days had met with polite refusals, coupled with cheerful prophecies of his early employment, to be sure. Max had taken little stock in this consoling optimism, but it had all helped to keep alive his spirits, which had sunk again to their lowest ebb at Kleiman's epithet, Dead One. After all, he was a dead one, he reflected, as he stumbled along the sidewalk toward his boarding-house on Irving Place. A man of sixty, safely entrenched in his own business, with the confidence his wealth inspires, is in the very prime of his life. But Max, with his health impaired and his employment taken away from him, felt and looked a decrepit old man as he tottered upstairs to his third-floor room and flung himself on the bed where he lay for more than an hour staring at the ceiling. During that interval he reviewed his career from the time he helped his father, a Prussian refugee of 1848, in the little country store upstate. Then came his father's death, followed by a clerkship in the large dry-goods business of his father's competitors. After this he had moved to New York, and from that time on he had followed the calling of a traveling salesman with varying success, until at sixty he found himself out of health and employment, with property of less than two thousand dollars as a reserve fund. What a fool he had been not to accept Perlmutter's offer! Nevertheless, it seemed futile for a man of sixty to make a new start in a strange town, especially since, in rural communities, business goes as much by favor and friendship as by commercial enterprise. Now had he been offered a partnership in a store in his native town, where it would be an easy matter to renew old acquaintance, he might have viewed the proposition differently. He rose from the bed and sat down in an armchair, while his mind reverted to more pleasant topics. He pictured to himself his father's store, underneath what the townspeople called the opera house. He saw again that dingy little hall with its small proscenium opening guarded by a frayed old curtain, and he smiled as he remembered the landscape it bore. With the sophistication of his race, he had enjoyed many a good laugh at the performance that had evoked the tears of his fellow townsmen. What rubes they were, to be sure! And yet, what good fellows the boys had been! He recalled various ones by name, and found himself wondering how they looked, and whether they were married or single. Another half an hour of like musing, and suddenly he slapped his thigh. By jinks, he said, I'll do it. I need a vacation, and I'm going to have it too. End of section six.